Welcome to the California Master Beekeeper Program's very first guest lecture of 2024. It is our pleasure this evening to welcome Mia McNeil. Mia is going to speak to us on honey fraud. Mia is a venerable beekeeper. You're a master beekeeper. She's also a, a published author. Uh, she writes narrative, nonfiction, as well as fiction. She is an organic farmer and, as I mentioned, a beekeeper. And she is currently in the process of publishing a book called Bee Club. We look very forward to its publication uh, towards the end of this year. Uh, in case you're not familiar with the California Master Beekeeper Program, we've been disseminating science-based beekeeping information through a network of organizations and trained volunteers since 2016. And we're essentially a, a continuous train the trainer program. Our vision is to certify honeybee ambassadors, apprentice, journey and master level beekeepers so they can effectively communicate the importance of honeybees and other pollinators within your local community and, and serve as mentors for other beekeepers. So we thank you again for your time this evening and your interest in all things science-based beekeeping. So Mia, we welcome you and we are excited to learn all there is to know about honey fraud. So I invite you to share your screen and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, I'm honored to be invited to speak to you. Um, you're all welcome to come into my uh, little uh, writing niche here. I work here as a journalist. And as a journalist, I gather information about one subject or another, hoping to give kind of a, um, an overview. Uh, I work kind of like a, a fly on the wall. I gather things from here and there. I'm not giving you my firsthand information. So you're getting what I have learned. And as it, as it happens, people will ask me, what are you writing about? And it was very strange to me that when I said honey fraud, people who were lay people and even people who are familiar with beekeeping or are beekeepers would say the same thing. Is that a thing? Very few people are familiar with what honey fraud is, and it is indeed a thing, a big thing. These are my sources as a journalist that I have drawn on for the information that I'm going to share with you. The National Honey Board, which you may not know, I didn't know, is really an arm of the USDA, although it's, it's kind of a colonial outpost where they do the work and the government does nothing. But anyway, the UC Davis Honey and Pollination Center has been very good at disseminating information about honey fraud. Uh, Amina Harris, since she just recently retired, has been very good on that subject. Um, the UCLA uh, Center for Food Law and Policy, they have been really, they have been so strong advocates for any problems with uh, food fraud. The USDA, well, we'll talk about them. The Appamundia uh, did an incredible a number of speakers in 2022 in Istanbul on the prod, on the subject of, of honey fraud. And then they came back at this last uh, Appamundia and again uh, brought people in to talk about the, the problem and to update it. The American Honey Producers Association is a group of about 550 producers, they're beekeepers, producers of honey, and they have been boots on the ground. I think they have done more than anyone to move things 
forward to make people aware of what the problem is. Ron Phipps is an interesting resource because he is a honey producer and he's an importer. And I think he even exports too, but he writes for the American Bee Journal and he keeps, really keeps a finger on the pulse of what's happening in the honey world. And he, he, he made an interesting comment in his last, uh, his fall, uh, his, his fall column. He said the honey fraud situation in the United States is like, is, it's, it's like a Shakespearean uh, tragedy. And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. I thought about what puts together a Shakespearean tragedy and occurred to me, well, that's probably a pretty good description of what's going on. There's good and evil. There's a fatal flaw. And there are internal and external pressures. Let's just uh, get the lay of the land here before we really get into the weeds. So fraud, of course, in food is, is ubiquitous. In this country, olive oil is the most, uh, the most. Excuse uh, me, Mia, uh, would yeah. you, would you share your screen now, please? It's not shared? No. I, oh. I see it. Oh, do you? Yeah. I'm seeing olive oil, fish, and honey at the bottom. Yeah, I see it too. See it too. Now what? Should I go and get Jerome to help move it forward? Okay. So those are the those are the most adulterated foods in our culture, and uh, olive oil is the most. Seafood is the second, and honey is the third. But it's not a new problem. The uh, the Romans were all over how to uh, how to adulterate honey, <laughs> they, and um, for a long time, um, Americans bought just comb honey to make sure that they were getting pure honey. If they bought it in a jar, they didn't know quite what it was going to be. So it was the turn of the 20th century that this guy Harvey Wiley became the chief chemist of the Department of Agriculture, actually the very first one. And he was investigating food fraud and looked at honey and found there was plenty of honey that was on the market with added sugar. And what he used to figure it out was a polariscope. This little item uh, creates two polarizing, um, Hold on a second here. Let me get, get this out of the way. Whoops. There. He, uh, this has two polarizing lenses. And this is a modern polariscope with polarizing lenses that's used with the Welsh method of honey competition. Uh, you may be familiar with that. They, they, prefer the honey to be very highly filtered. They like everything out of it. The polariscope would show if there was even pollen in it. And so many of us as beekeepers value, and we'll talk a little more about that, value the presence of pollen in the honey. So this guy, uh, Harvey Wiley, he pioneered the first a Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906, and it took 32 more years for any further regulation to take place. And the reason that I bring this up to you is that the 1938 Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act is what we have still today. This is our regulation. And what it did was divide the responsibility between the FDA and the USDA. The FDA were to be the guides, the advisors. The USDA was to make the standards, the definitions. And so here we have the fatal flaw. <laughs> and that is that the USDA waited a while until the 50s to start making any standards, that is definitions. And they took up 
peanut butter. Well, nobody could agree on what peanut butter is, whether it's, you know, this amount of lard or no lard or sugar, whatever. Nobody could agree. And so the USDA threw up their hands and said, forget it. We are not doing definitions anymore. Just get us involved if there is somebody, if there's something toxic, if there's something dangerous. So the USDA got stuck in peanut butter and there have been no definitions since. No definition of honey, no definitions that would help us in the situation that we're in with fraudulent honey. Now, just to uh, remind you, if you haven't been become already pretty depressed, that um, our bees have been declining for quite some time. And not to wade too far into the weeds about that, um, it does feed to our, whoops, our situation with the yield per colony that we're getting. And surely there are a number of reasons for all this, but we do know this would be the, uh, between 2000 and 2009, this would be the yield um, in pounds for a, a typical colony. And this would be the yield now, or 2020 that is, it has declined significantly. Now we can talk about the reasons for that, that can be, uh, many, but we do know that the honey yields have dropped. What we do know for sure is honey production in millions of tons here has dropped significantly over the years. What's interesting is that foreign honey dumping during that time has dropped prices for the producers below what it costs for them to produce. Here, I think this is interesting. The red is the production in this country. The, um, the, uh, the blue is imports and the top, the dark blue is consumption. And what, what has happened during this period over the last three years is that the Honey Board has reported that for the first time, Americans have decided that honey is their preferred sweetener over sugar. That's a big one. Here's another just graph of, of somewhat the same thing. This tells where our honey, our domestic honey comes from. Here, California is the blue and so forth, excuse me. And, um, and this line here, this dark line, is the imports of honey as they've risen precipitously over the years. So where is that honey coming from? We are the importers of the honey in the world. The United States here is in the blue, and this is 2019, 2020, 2021, and the EU is the second, Japan is the third, interestingly enough, isn't it? And these are other, other countries, Australia, you know, so forth. The four main importers are USA, EU, Japan, and the UK. And when you see where the honey is coming from, it's interesting to see because it's coming from Southeast Asia, it's coming from South America, some a little from Canada, um, and into the EU, it's coming from South America and from Asia. But check out this green line here. The honey that's going into the UK is coming almost exclusively from China. China is producing a quarter of the world's honey, has been for some time. The EU produces quite a bit, but these countries here are producing quite small percentages, the United States 4% and so forth. 
and many other countries' tiny little slices of production. So we have here from China uh, a lot of honey coming out and other countries that are honey producers producing a great deal less. For decades, unripe Chinese honey has been dumped in the US for very cheap prices. And that is a reason that American honey producers have had to move to pollination because they can't afford to sell their honey. In 2001, the Byrd Amendment, 25 years ago, uh, brought anti-dumping suit uh, by the American Honey Producers Association against China. And that suit resulted in, in the Byrd Amendment imposing taxes on Chinese honey to 200, over 200%, 200 221%. So a few months after that law was in effect, a last line antibiotic, one that we use in hospitals, was found in Chinese honey, chloramphenicol. And that would have, if you remember, that the USDA was going to step in only if it was a health concern, if it was toxic, that would have brought them into the picture, except there was no Chinese honey to be found. It was nowhere. Well, this, I think, this graph, which comes from the American honey producers, I think is a bit of hyperbole, but it does tell the story. And that is, this is the number of, of hives. This is the number of hives in the, in the main Eastern honey export countries over that period. And this is their exports. So it was pretty easily, um, it was pretty obvious where all the Chinese honey was going. Now, this would be a normal balanced production of a bunch of European countries here, um, Slovenia, Sweden, um, Austria, Croatia, Denmark, and so forth. And the green line is their honey production. And so they didn't have a whole lot to export. And this is their imports that makes up the difference between what they were producing and what they were needing for their own needs. Makes perfect sense. Here is the volume of exports from India. And it goes up precipitously. But over the last, so 20 years ago, uh, uh, Ron Phipps said the exports from India were negligible. There was hardly any honey coming out of India. So there was a honey packer in the United States that sent a young, um, young woman who was one of their employees to go and check some of these packing facilities in Asia. And her name is Joyce. She asked not to have her last name shared. And she said, she was astonished at what she found. Everywhere she went, she found no equipment. She found barrels of Chinese honey, unused and inadequate, rusty, poor equipment. She found fake documents stacked up in desks. And she found that the Chinese were buying these facilities and they were, um, they were, so it was a horizontal expansion and a vertical expansion by the Chinese. So this was the biggest, uh, this was the biggest honey fraud, I think, in history. In 2008, the AL Wolf Company was based in Germany and they had 
a pretty sweet deal going on. They had offices all through China and they would gather up honey and transship it to other Asian countries. And then they had offices in the United States and they would sell the honey to processors, cheap, cheap honey. And uh, if, the, if the buyers would, would turn it down, they would just go and find another buyer. When they were busted, there were some low level, a few, I think two or three low level people that were in the office. And the people who, uh, who perpetrated this fraud escaped to Germany, and they're still under indictment uh, for, um, for what they did. It's 2008, and, uh, and haven't, haven't left. End of story. So as this thing evolved, the Canadians found a quarter of their imported honey adulterated, and they were able to stop some imports, and this uh, and Australia had 20% um, of their imports and half of the supermarket samples had simple sugars added to them. And um, the EU had, again, samples that were had foreign added sugars. In 2020, after this uh, 2008 uh, fiasco, they, uh, the Americans got NMR equipment. New Zealand, the annual production of Manuka honey, somebody this morning in the locker room at, at, at honey said, at, at, uh, at, at swimming asked me about honey, asked me about Manuka honey and said, said, we got this Manuka honey, it's so expensive. And I'm thinking, so the annual production is 1700 tons, but some 10,000 are sold globally each year and you would pay uh, handsomely for the for the phony manuka. The the um, I should say the New Zealanders have done a really good job of certifying what is really uh, manuka honey. Here's a bust. At least this is uh, somewhat uh, uh, satisfying. Customs and Border Protection and Homeland Security uh, have uh, are seizing. Um, some border uh, honey in Houston. Chinese honey is valued at two and a half million or so. So what's going on? All of this, all of this stuff. They're substituting things, they're importing um, all kinds of sugars. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, mislabeled jars and documents that are are, are um, fraudulently written, uh, the whole range of possibilities here. And what is it exactly that they're doing? Okay, so they're adding sugars. A lot of these sugars are bioengineered and they're available online, these sugars, in order to um, avoid detection. Um, this one here is a um, this is a, uh, a UK chain store um, that had sugar syrup in it, the honey. This is an American uh, supplier that had Vietnamese sugar syrup in it. This one in Australia, this is a chain, and it got out of being um, prosecuted by contesting the way that the testing was done. So it's, it's a difficult situation. Overheating, as you probably know about, uh, you know, uh, sugar syrup that's left out in the sun, this HMF can produce a, a, is a toxic chemical compound that comes from overheating. But if the, if the honey is in processing is overheated, then you can have HMF in it. And that's a problem. This one is from Whole Foods, for gosh sakes. And this one is from Safeway. This one's from Nature Nates. They've all found uh, overheating in it. And in order to clean that up, 
there's resin manipulation now that is done in order to remove HMF. We all know as beekeepers that sugar syrup, uh, that we don't feed the bees during the nectar flow uh, so that we don't get sugar syrup you know, in, our, in our honey, but that can be done intentionally in order to enlarge the, uh, the yield. And this one is a big one for these imports because um, even though uh, bona fide uh, packers will get some honey that is a little, uh, little viscous and they will vacuum dry it somewhat. That's a, that's a process that they, that they have. There is a whole thing of factory dehydrated nectar that is nectar that is, is um, extracted before it's ripe. So that's most of honey from China. And, and one quote that Ron Phipps uh, had is that 100% of the Indian honey is extracted uh, immaturely. That was what he had to say. And number five is additives. So these, uh, these honeys are sent to, to other countries and stripped of their pollen. And then there can be pollen added from another country, for example, from Argentina. This one is an interesting anomaly. It's a Saudi honey with added ingredients. And this one happens to be the ingredients of Viagra. Uh, the, uh, the FDA issued a warning about this particular product, but it's still, I see, uh, available for $49.99. So we're thinking in Shakespearean terms of the good guys and the bad guys. But I have to say that it's pretty shocking to be at Epimundia in Montreal to see that some of the bad guys are our own people. Maybe not on purpose, but that's the way it turned out. 46% of the people who brought honey for competition were disqualified for having added sugars, antibiotic chloramphenicol, and overheated honey. That's, that's all I can say is that it uh, is a sad, a sad, a sad, sad thing. So um, here's a, a headline from The Guardian, which is all UK honey tested in EU fraud investigator fails authenticity test. And I think that might have something to do with the fact that the UK is bringing in so much honey from China. This guy, Schwarzenegger, Professor Schwarzenegger, heads a testing center in Germany and he says, these manipulations are improving, the materials are improving, the cover-ups are improving, the skill is improving. And it, he says, honey fraud is like sports doping. So the adulterated honey game is no ceiling on quantities. You can make as much as you want. You got sugar, you got water. And there's no floor on the prices, so sell it, sell it for cheap. So what are we going to do about it? So the first thing we need is a legal definition. A definition that would allow us to move legally against anything that isn't honey, real honey. We need testing and we need duties against dumping. So we saw that the Chinese were stopped dead in their tracks, even though they diverted, they sent their, their, their honey elsewhere, but dumping duties worked in that case. So for number one, a definition, what is honey? 
So this guy, uh, Michael Roberts here, is from the um, is from the UCLA Resnick Center, and uh, he is pictured here with a guy from the EU, um, Jose Graziano de Silva, and he's the Director General of the UNFAO. And they got together in 2019, and they came up with a good definition of honey. And that entered what the Europeans have is the Codex Alimentarius. And that is the standard for all kinds of food. I'm gonna bet they probably have peanut butter in there. So Michael Roberts was commissioned by the US Honey Board to write up a white paper all about this, which he did. And then it was frozen. Now, there were a bunch of us who got to see it, but it was passed around, you know, under the table and nobody could figure out why it hadn't been published, but we, anyway. And so we, we were wondering if it wasn't that the, the large uh, packers were reading that the definition of honey was that it had to have pollen in it. And for them, Superfiltration was stripping the pollen out of honey. And why? Why did they do that? Because consumers don't understand that crystallized honey is not spoiled. And so that's why, to make it shelf stable, they strip it. And so the theory, and nobody has confirmed that, okay, so, and it remains a theory that the report was frozen was that um, that definition didn't fit the American uh, business model. So we remained without a definition. That definition that they had in Europe had no teeth in this country. So what happened was a couple of private groups, the U US Pharmacopeia and the Food Chemical Codex, they got together and they came up with a definition that was very, very similar to the codex definition. Uh, honey is a natural sweet substance produced by bees from plants. Um, the bees collect, they transform with specific substances of their own. They deposit hydrate store and leave in the honeycomb to ripen. That leaves the pollen in the honey. So, um, that's what we have now, but it's not official. For testing, most of the labs are in Germany and American producers use these, these labs that are in Germany. They have offices in the United States, but the actual testing takes place there. Sweetwater, is in Missouri. That's an American lab. So those are that's pretty much what we have for testing labs. A couple more. The tests are interesting. What happened in the past is that the sugar syrups that probably Dr. Wiley was dealing with were sugar cane and corn syrup. And those are C4 plants. They're traditional, traditionally used, and they're warm weather plants. What happened is that the uh, adulterers, I'll call them that, of honey uh, began skirting the tests by using three C3 tests. These are cool weather plants, like um, like rice, rice syrup. And the, those plants use different pathways for photosynthesis, and not all tests can show both. These are tests that are used now. NMR compares honey to a, a gigantic database. So you take a specific one and see if it matches. Here's HMRS, and that, um, go, that identifies molecular weight. Um, for specific syrups. And IMRS can detect foreign, uh, 
foreign syrups, foreign sugars. Now, there was uh, in, at, in Turkey, there was a guy from Lebanon who put up his hand and, and said, hey, we, we have a lab, we test honey all the time, and you're not mentioning our lab test. And the speaker who is Klaus Beckman, he is a, has got a lab, he says, that's because your test tests only for C4 plants. It doesn't test for C3. So Beckman said, the next question was, so how do you really find out? He says, do them all. Well, huh, they're expensive. So that's quite a, that's quite a charge. On the left is Chris Hyatt. He is the president of the honey producers. He's quite a guy. He, I, uh, have in, I've uh, interviewed him a few times, driving uh, semis uh, over the mountains as he, uh, as he brings his bees from here to there. And he is in front of the, uh, of the uh, NMR machine that he and the rest of the honey producers lobbied Congress for one and a half million dollars to buy. And here is the HRMS uh, machine, uh, diagnostic machine, in the lab in Gastonia, North Carolina. The left is Roger Simons and the right is uh, Dimitri Cobb. The, the Cobb is the scientist that runs the machine and Simon, Simons is the head of the, of the lab. But you have to, have to uh, realize that this lab does all the testing, all the molecular testing for the USDA. This will give you an example of what can be seen by an NMR profile. The colors are of the, whatever the authentic honey is. And then the addition of rice syrup, you can see on the black line. Here, this was an interesting young woman, a, a um, Turkish, a young, very young Turkish woman scientist. And uh, she showed this um, readout. And these are all different um, kinds of, of uh, of authentic nectars, except for this, which is brown rice syrup. So she was able to pick out these different ones, which are um, authentic pine honey and, uh, and so forth, authentic blossom honey and, and so forth. Oh yeah. So how well are we doing? The honey that's coming into this country is 1% tested. That's how much of it that's coming in, going onto the shelves that we know for sure is real. So did the FDA come to the rescue? They used the US pharmacopoeia definition of honey for some port entry tests. Hooray, they used a definition, but they used a method, Scoria method, that tests only for the C4 sugars, which is the same as the guy in Lebanon, which is testing for a little bit of stuff that no self-respecting honey fraudster would use. So we we'll talk about dumping duties again. Remember, China has worked out very well for us, uh, from at least from that end. Vietnam, this is their uh, their honey production, and this uh, these are they have no imports, and these are their exports. Looks a little suspicious. So here, the anti-dumping duties that were um, 
that, that were imposed in June 2022. So here's Vietnam, and here is 2021 is the blue line. So Vietnam is close to uh, bringing in nearly all of the most anyway of the honey that's coming into this country. So the Department of Commerce issued these anti-dumping duties around 60% in June 2022. And what happened? The red line is 2022 from here to here. Possible, huh? It's possible. But India, and we see the, the honey that's coming in from India, growing and growing and growing. Last September, these same beekeepers, uh, they uh, petitioned the U.S. International Trade Commission to raise the anti-dumping penalties from six to seven percent uh, of India from India, and they were rejected. So the Indian honey is still coming in with a very cheap, a very cheap penalty. And you see here, 2021, 2022, much more. So it's, it's a major, major imported. And this was half, only half of 2023. So they're, they are um, on their merry way. So the question is, where are we now? We have got got the good guys and the bad guys. And we have a fatal flaw that's still really not, not well fixed. So we're just looking for the deus ex machina. We're looking for the, for the miracle. I said Ron Phipps, that's the only way out of this one. Here, this is a few, this is a little bit of this and that and the other thing here. Um, each one of these subjects would be a whole talk, but they're related enough to mention, and that's labeling. When you look at a varietal chief floral source, it's, for example, if it says clover, it can be only 27%. If the other honeys are 23 to 25% with it. So varietal means very little, and USDA grade A means nothing. It's self-labeled. When did you ever see a USDA grade B uh, honey, even the very worst cooking honey, really? And geographic origin, very hard to find it on a, on a label, really. It's tiny, tiny writing. It's supposed to be on the front, by the way. And then unhoney, bee-free bee honey, all this vegan, uh, um, you know, uh, slavery free honey or whatever they call it. Um, all of those, those are legally called honey because we don't have a definition, a legal definition for what is honey. And don't even get me started on organic. Uh, organic is, um, Organic is a big problem, and that's way back when Eric Musson was called onto a committee to decide what organic honey is, and it was in, he said, please, these beekeepers can't possibly um, can't possibly have their bees on certified organic forage, and how about if they just you know keep the insides of their hives clean and uh, no he didn't get anywhere with it and so we pretty much except I think for a grandfathered in Hawaiian company we pretty much don't have um, organic honey uh, here in the mainland and um, so it's all imported but there is no oversight nobody goes to the organic honey producer in 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 South America and looks at those bees and what they're how they're kept or so that's that's that story. Ooh. 
So there are certifications here. True Source is they've gone out and tried to test. They have a pretty uneven record, I have to say. Genuine Honey has tried to come up behind and do the same thing. I'm not saying that these are, are labels that would tell you that your honey is pure. So the International Trade Commission has got a really pretty spotty record, as you just saw. And these are interesting people, the certified naturally grown people. They will, they're, they're going to take your word for it, but they ask you a lot of questions about how you keep your bees and what you use on your bees to give you that certification. Local honey is an interesting question. Costco has recalled uh, some honey that they had labeled local that turned out to be coming from uh, North Dakota, and they were honest about it. They have been pretty good. I've talked to a number of beekeepers who have said that Costco has followed up, has done testing. They're pretty good about their honey as far as people that are selling um, honey retail in bulk. The Texas beekeepers, I have to say, these people have, have really done something pretty wonderful. And that is that they were going around seeing on the shelves of supermarkets, local honey that was water white and all of their honey is amber colored from the forage that they have where they are. So there was no way for that to be local honey. And they went around and visited some of these people and some of them are the children and grandchildren of beekeepers that were keeping bees and they said oh too much trouble so we just buy it and bottle it up so they said we're going to certify and so they went around and and have a, a seal that they put on their honey for people who are really keeping bees so that's pretty much that's pretty much the the sad uh, the sad tragedy of our of our honey situation right now. Except except when it comes from our local people, and there we have pure honey. We have real honey, and it is for us to be able to share with others the most important piece of information about this, and that is to know your beekeeper and to buy your honey from somebody who is keeping bees responsibly. That's it. Thank you, Mia. Thank you for a, a, a very educative demonstration of honey and uh, just helping us know uh, where to look for the difference between adulterated honey and, and real honey. It's just knowing your beekeeper is a good place to start. Yeah, thank you. I, we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, Jerry asks, how unripe honey turned into something that looks, smells, flows, and tastes like honey. Do, do we know that? Like, mm. who are the food scientists behind all of this? Mm. They, 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 they dehydrate it. That's what they do. They dehydrate it. And um, it's pretty, it's a very, very, very common. It's commonly done at a small amount to our to our honey, but I think it's it's uh, a major process. Mm -hmm. And as beekeepers, we know that if we're extracting honey, we want to make sure that when we put a frame in our extractor, before we uncap it, that uh, right. you know over ninety five percent of those cappings have been sealed, and then we are pretty much guaranteed the bees can keep that liquid to about 18 percent 
right? Because uh, Jerry also had a question regarding the percentage of water and honey by definition. And I'm not sure if I'm answering that question for you, Jerry, or whether there's a, a something that you'd like to expand on. I just wanted to add that the reason that we don't feed children under a year um, for because of the danger of botulism, it has only to do with the danger of unripe honey. Some of, and it has to do with irresponsible beekeepers that would be somehow or another selling or making available unripe honey because the ripe honey is does not will not it's uh it's hydroscopic and it's antibiotic and it would not give a child botulism mm. mm -hmm. oh we have another question does pure honey makeup depend on the type of pollen or nectar which could vary right oh. um no it'll vary uh, the pure pure honey comes from so many different sources and the viscosity and the um, the color and so forth varies quite a lot. If you look at the at a honey fund, a honey chart, a color chart from way, way, very, very dark, almost brown to water white. Yeah. Yeah, and Jerry mentioned he uses 18% water as a standard as well. Um, and he, uh, Jerry's curious if you have anything to say about uh, residues of, uh, say, mite treatments in honey. For example, he keeps bees without resorting to petrochemical treatments, right? Um, yeah. We don't, as it happens, we don't use them. And so um, I know that there's a lot of discussion about residue. Mm -hmm. and we did here in Marin some years ago, you know, 10 years ago. We did a we did a study, a pollen study. We did it over eight months, and we had a number of different sites where we gathered pollen, and we actually sent it to that lab that you saw a picture of. That's actually how I got a hold of Roger Simons. Uh, we did it with the University of Pennsylvania and the USDA lab at Gastonia, North Carolina, and they tested these, and we found they found 22 different pesticides in Marin County, just beehives. And uh, of those five are, are toxic to bees. And so I went to our, our, local, our, our local ag commissioner who happened to be um, a, an, an entomologist. And he said that, yes, he said, uh, almost all of those are from backyard gardens. Almost the, all of those chemicals are from backyard gardens. But so yes, the bees pick up all kinds of junk wherever they go, whatever. Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm. And, and we as beekeepers need to remind ourselves that the label is a law. And a lot of my treatments, uh, if we've got honey supers on are, well, illegal. Right. We want to make sure that when we have our honey supers on, that it's away for the most part from any mite treatments, unless the said treatments are deemed safe during a for use during the honey flow, of Ooh. which there is one that I'm aware of. Um, so really? good points, really good points. Uh, and refractometers, uh, Jerry mentions, you know, are, are inexpensive and everybody should have one so that we can um, uh, look at our honey and, and note what, what percentage moisture we're at for sure. Hmm. Um, How much are they? I, I've seen them for $35, not that expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Stacy also brings up a really great point, which I think I'd like to uh, follow up on because she, she says, do we have a, a concise flyer written in layman's terms that honey sellers could hand out at farmers markets to help educate the public? Wouldn't that be good? Mm -hmm. That would be very good. 
So my, my first thought is, I wonder if uh, AHPA has something to that effect, right? The American Honey Producers Association. Good so yeah. yeah, I They're, would check into that. They, boy, they, they are such hard workers. They're doing wonderful, wonderful work. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, if there is anybody here who would like to unmute and ask a question, you've got the floor, just raise your hand. I note that Ellen says in the chat that it's, uh, it is shocking. Yes, it is shocking on the adulteration and uh, it is, uh, as she's also stating, that it's uh, sad and frustrating, and it's up to us to inform the public, really. So thank you. I'm going to jump to, um, just at the very end, I'm just going to jump to uh, a, a painting that's going to be eventually on the cover of this book before I say goodbye. And it's by George Hansen. It's a... Uh, it's an encaustic painting done with wax. It's a beautiful, beautiful painting. And we look forward to the publication of your book later this year, Mia. So on behalf of the California Master Beekeeper Program and all of us here this evening, we thank you so much for your generosity of time and spirit and educating us about honey adulteration and honey fraud. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.